Hey, I just wanted to save. It seems like I'm running through a lot of projects really fast. You're right, I am. Um, the stay-at-home COVID situation is not going to last forever, and I want to blow through a backlog of projects as quickly as possible so I can get to more interesting stuff. So, bear with me. Um, the waxing, the polishing, the fine-tuning I can do later on, but I want to get the bulk of the brunt work done as quickly as possible. Welcome to the start of another project. In part one, you saw me go through when the owner just dropped it off and did a quick visual inspection. Well, now I'm going to actually start working on it. So, just brief recap. This set, um, the owner uh, had been looking for for a while, I guess, and he finally found one, and he brought it over to a repair shop that thought they would be able to make it work uh, again <laughs> but after I think a couple years that they poked around with it they finally admitted that they couldn't get it to work and they gave up and they gave him a spiel about oh I think a coil was bad it was impossible to get a replacement and it was never going to work again or something like that they also replaced the picture tube twice along the way um, which makes me think they probably broke it uh, from having it sit in the shop for so long, <laughs> or broke, broke two of them. Anyways, the owner found out about me, perhaps because he googled this model, because I actually restored one of these before, uh, uh, an Admiral 20B1 chassis, the exact same thing, for another guy uh, who also dropped off the chassis for me to restore. So, not only do I have a lot of experience with early Admirals, but this particular model I have worked on before. So what are we looking at here? <clears throat> this is the power supply chassis. And it looks so nice because the owner cleaned it up and painted it. So, top side looks great. What's not so great is what's below. So, yes, they did do work on it. The original electrolytics have been cut out of the circuit. The new caps have been tacked in at various points and need to verify that they're correct value and voltage rating and that they're hooked up in the right spot. I've done somewhat similar stuff before um, in terms of tacking them onto the tube base and the ground lug around the ring on the bottom, but some of these are a little loose, so I may end up relocating them or adding a terminal strip. Two worst things I see right away. They left a bunch of paper caps in here. I don't know why. They replaced some of them. And since they were working on this, they must have been powering it up repeatedly. Why they wouldn't have replaced the remaining paper caps, I have no idea. The other big problem is this. This is a big power resistor called a Candome. C-A-N-D-O-H-M. <clears throat> Basically, it's a resistor in a can. It's an early form of chassis mounting, a resistor, a power resistor to use the chassis to dissipate the heat. They tend to go bad. For insulation, they'd use this kind of fish paper stuff that can break down, or the resistance wire inside can snap, especially if the filter caps start uh, getting really leaky and there's excessive current draw. All right, great, they cut that out, fine. But what's not fine is the replacement. Two problems. One, it's the wrong value. Original was 1.7K, this is a 1K, so it's just a little more than half of the value it should be. The other thing is that they mounted it here, just floating in free space. This is uh, supposedly a 25 watt resistor. That's only if it's mounted well to a heat sink with uh, ideally thermal compound, firmly seated, making good contact, and free space, especially when this is flipped over and it's basically sealed against the bottom of the cabinet. It's probably more like a 5 watt resistor in terms of it uh, being able to dissipate heat. So I've got a replacement 1.8K. And I will be drilling out these rivets and mounting it over here, replace the paper caps, and double check all the work. That's what we're going to do on this one first. Then I will move on to the TV, and finally I will do the radio. Also, some of the wiring is a little chewed up, so I guess the speaker had connected here. It's gone. And so briefly what we're looking at here is power supply and audio amp. As I mentioned briefly in my predict the holiday restoration series. Vintage TVs typically needed three positive DC voltages to work. 
a main B plus for the sweep circuits, um, audio output, uh, horizontal output tube, and so on. Then usually a lower B plus for the IF circuit, like so. Typically, maybe 300 volts for the main B plus, and then like 150 for the IF stuff, and then typically a boosted voltage for the vertical output, maybe 400 volts, 450 volts. So how do you get that? Well, if you look at the early RCA set, like the 630TS, their first flagship set, it was really, I guess you'd say over-engineered, I think, because it was a, well, the first mass-produced commercial TV, and they wanted it to work well. Well, what they did is they used two 5U4s in parallel, the really beefy power transformer, and used a massive voltage divider, a huge power resistor with taps on it for the voltages they needed. Later, more refined designs into the late 50s, 60s, used a stack B+, where they'd use a Class A audio output stage, which has a fixed bias and pretty much a fixed current draw, and they used the audio output tube as a voltage divider, and they'd pick off about half of the B+, voltage at the cathode. And then there's this technique, which is two power supplies. I mean, the early versions of this actually had two power transformers side by side. This one has dual secondaries. So this would be the main B+. 5U4 rectifier, filter choke, filter cap. And then this is the other power supply. 5Y3, lower secondary voltage, filter choke, filter cap. Then this is a push-pull audio output. Preamp, phase inverter, push-pull output, output transformer. Now since they had been working on this, it kind of worked at some point, I'm going to assume all this stuff is okay, the transformers and the chokes and so on, and just fix up the wiring, then move on to the TV. I've got enough spare Admiral bits and pieces, I think I could replace just about anything in this if it's bad. I'm going to go with the assumption that they didn't fry anything. Hopefully I won't regret that decision. Using one of those titanium coated drill bits made quick work of the rivets. Uh, got both of these out now. Now, the curious thing about this is it does actually measure continuity and it measures about 1K. So I wonder if they went by the measured value rather than what they looked up. Obviously, they wrote it on here. Well, there is a part number stamped on this. So I'm going to look that up 61A3 9 and see what that cross references to. Either way, uh, I'm not going to use these, but I thought that was curious. Now, as for mounting the new ones, one thing that kind of bugs me about these is, so I want to mount it here, and I want to drill some holes for it. But I want to drill them from the other side, because i got stuff in the way on this side. Well, there's no way you can flip it around and orient it such that you can line up where the drilling hole should be. You'd have to kind of flip it upside down like that. And Maybe get a long, thin writing instrument or something, and you can make a mark on it. Um, but what I uh, did is I just took a scrap of paper, Sharpie, made some dots, and then I think if, yes, if I put it over here, the ink bled through, so simple solution to that issue. I have the new resistor mounted. And now I'm kind of sorting out the wiring and double checking the components. All these capacitor values are correct, so that's good. While doing so, I noticed a couple things. One, whoever did the soldering had a pretty heavy hand. I wonder if maybe they even used a soldering gun. These joints do not have that much solder on them, and the wire and insulation tends to be a bit messed up. Uh, luckily, I got plenty of extra lead length. I'm going to clip that off, clean it up secure this better. And I also noticed there's like bits of solder that kind of just flew around and so <laughs> I don't know what was exactly was going on. There's another fleck of solder here so I said I'll, I'll clean this up as best I can. Um, but while doing so I noticed that this lug is unused. And in between, uh, this one is ground and then here is this other um, 47 microfarad identical to this one. So, uh, I'm thinking, instead of having this cap kind of flop around a little bit loose, I'll put it up here. 
So these two black wires are the filter choke on the main B plus power supply. One of the wires goes there. I'll move the other one from down here over to there and put the two caps next to each other. So in other words, the main B plus power supply filtering stuff will all be localized right there. This is correct. There's just a single 33 microfarad on the lower B plus. The other side of the filter choke for that one just goes directly out of this power supply. There's no second cap on that power supply on this chassis. I know on the main TV chassis there are several large electrolytics. I'm sure there's additional B plus filtering going on on that chassis. Uh, as I've discussed before, ideally you put the caps where they're needed. So the power comes out of here, goes through this long cable up to the other chassis where it's actually used for stuff. So hey, why not put the filter cap up there to take care of any noise that may be picked up along this wire. Uh, so then there's the stuff which I haven't gotten into yet. Uh, these are kind of crusty looking caps. Of course, I'll replace all those. Probably go ahead and replace the resistors while I'm at it. Um, yeah. Making good progress. I uh, routed one wire down here to this guy, put some heat shrink tubing over it to add some little extra insulation. And I gotta run the main B plus here. So this is the power for the radio. It takes the main B plus, goes to this big beefy resistor, then goes off to the radio chassis. I'm pretty much done with this chassis now. I did look up this part number and yeah, 1.7k 20 watt. So odd that it's only measuring 1k now. Uh, as for this, let's see, I did relocate that cap over here and ran a wire down. Uh, I'd still have to mount the new power resistor to replace this guy, but otherwise I just kind of went through and blew through and replaced uh, all the old paper caps and carbon comp resistors. So I'm going to drill some holes, mount that, and then uh, call this guy done, and then uh, let's move on to the TG TV chassis. Alrighty, here is the TV chassis. For some reason in my mind I thought this was a 10 inch, but no, I see it's obviously a 12 inch now. And yeah, this does appear to be a replacement picture tube, although it has the same color ink, or very similar. Um, typically on a, an animal chassis of this era, you would see the same letter stamped on various parts. So this has a K here. There should be a K somewhere on the chassis, and then be a K on the picture tube. I'm guessing that is to help the factory workers know that all these parts go together. But what we do see on this is 2M50, which I assume means the second month of 1950. And I just noticed this. It says wired for 12 LP4 OC, maybe? sure what that means. Oh yeah, you can see there's a K down here too. Uh, it's not the revision though, because they would, they would go by run number, so it's probably run 10. They do run 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Anyways, um, I did also notice just now that this base is quite loose, so I'll be putting a little glue in there to tighten that up. Uh, I said this tested okay. I'm, this is a replacement picture too, but I'll I'll test it too to make sure. So what's wrong with this? Well, one thing I noticed right away is the power cord. <laughs> There's supposed to be a safety interlock here. Uh, hang on, I got the original power cord to look like right here. I have a small stash of new old stock replacement ones. This is it, non-polarized, it's got ears on it. This would have been riveted in like so. And then there'd be a corresponding two-pin interconnect on the other side. They ripped all that out and just shoved a power cord under this. And normally this would be screwed down. This is a high voltage stuff inside here. But if you do that here, it would crush the power cord. So this is not secured and this is just hardwired right into it. Ugly. 
so we're going to be fixing that up. I have scrapped out part out of a number of these chassis. Can't save them all, and sometimes they were big combo sets. Uh, some in like rotting basements. I also found some at estate or garage sales, like chassis in the garage. People back then saved everything. Um, people would tinker on their own too. So uh, at one place, I think I found uh, several chassis in the garage. One for a Zenith porthole and Admiral and so on. So that's why I've got spare parts for these. Um, including I might have a back cover that's still got the power cord on it. But if not, um, I can I can attach a new one. Uh, and likewise, so here's <laughs> they sort of left the inner connect there and just blew out the two pins. I'll drill out these rivets. I do have some replacements for this. I'll mount it with screws. Definitely not going to leave this situation as it is. All right, so here's the plug that goes to that power supply we were just looking at. This, I do believe, is the coil they were talking about that they say is no longer good. That is for the horizontal oscillator. And it's critical to not only the oscillation, but the locking functionality. So that would be, I believe, that guy. Oh no, sorry, sorry. Wrong, wrong, wrong. What am I saying? That's the vertical. Where's the horizontal? Uh, this guy. Although, I thought there was more to it than just a single coil. It's a lock. I think there's, I'm pretty sure there's two windings in there. I'm not sure where the other winding is on this schematic. Eh, but it's been a while since I worked on these. Maybe my memory's a little faulty, but I thought it was more than just a single coil. Hmm. Well, we shall see in a moment when I flip this over. Uh, the owner did paint this box. Looks like he didn't paint the main chassis, though. And there's a little splash of corrosion, but otherwise it's in pretty good shape. Pitcher tube on these admirals is uh, held in by a cloth strap that's held in on either side with these. This one is pretty secure, so typically I just leave the pitcher tubes in place. Um, some of the things I noted right away when I first got this chassis is this is broken off. I mean, this, this, honestly, in spite of some of the ugly repairs, that might be why the set isn't working. It's just because that wire broke off, but I definitely want to clean up some of the other stuff. And another bodge is that. There is a high-powered resistor inside all of these boxes on these early Admirals. Same goes for RCAs and a few other manufacturers. These are very, very commonly open. Well, they replaced it with three resistors in parallel that are just not really secured to anything. They still make resistors like that. You can get them. Uh, tubular ceramic that are meant for chassis mount with insulating washers. So, pretty sure I've got one on hand. If not, I can order one. So, we'll clean that up too. Now, let's take a look underneath. Here's a look underneath, and yeah, this is a little bit different than what I was thinking of. I was thinking of a somewhat similar chassis, 20X1, 20Y1. They would have a box here, and there'd be uh, five terminals on it. But no, that's just a single coil. But uh, now that I look again, I think this is the coil they're talking about. That's damaged, that's the width coil. It's got four wires coming out of it. It uh, The mounting is broken loose, and it doesn't have this the center... Adjustment slug thing has um, broken off. Doesn't mean it's bad, you just can't really adjust it. However, width is something you rarely need to mess a whole lot around with, and even when you do, it doesn't change the width very much. It's made for just a very fine tweaking. Same with the linearity coil nearby. Replacements do show up on eBay now and then, and I've probably got some I've scavenged, so I'm not too worried about that. More worried about some of the, more of these ugly repairs. So here's that power cord coming in that they just wire directly into the set. Uh, this power resistor, wow, that uh, that should really be replaced. <laughs> uh, and I'll have to go through this because I don't trust any of the work. 
but it looks like they did replace all of the paper caps. Um, these ceramics are probably replacements. I don't know if that ceramic is appropriate. I'll have to double check the voltage rating on these caps. Uh, so here's one of the candle electrolytics, and there's the other one down there. It looks like they did relocate caps kind of around here and there. A little ugly, but eh, that's what it is. These, I think, are replacements, but they're pretty old style caps. Probably plastic film, but um, pretty old school ones, like right from the 60s. Oh no, not, not horrible. Uh, but uh, we will go through it and see what we can do. Looks like they didn't replace any of, or they replaced very, very few of the resistors. Uh, hmm. So, where to start? Ah, uh, well, I'll take your pick. Man, uh, for now, I'll leave the power cord as is. At least it's, uh, enough to get started with. Ah, uh, well, sure I gotta replace that. Man, I should probably just pick a corner and start working my way through it. Uh, I'll check the continuity on these two. And, uh, if they have continuity on I'm not that concerned about it. It, uh, you know, if they got continuity, it, the set will work. I unmounted the with coil, or perhaps with transformer is a more accurate term, because it seems to have like a primary and a secondary. So there's two wires that are just enameled. Well, let's check the resistance between those two. Really low. So it's probably all right, because I would expect the resistance to be less than an ohm. And we've got two insulated wires, white and red. Let's check those out. Well, 0.8 ohms, so that also seems to have continuity. Alright, how about the linearity coil nearby? So 20 ohms. There's a lot of wire on that, so yeah. Believe that. And then uh, that's a big coil up here. Uh, also seems to have continuities. I think these are all fine. I'm more inclined to believe that whoever was working on this just got tired of it and, and gave up on it. Um, so, like, like I said, I'm just going to pick a corner. <sighs> I found one odd thing right away. I was wondering what this big power resistor down here was doing. 50 ohm, uh, 10 watt. Turns out it was in parallel with the linearity coil. I removed it and continuity and this seems to be okay, so I'm not sure why they would have put this in there. So, well, I'm going off the schematic and the SAMS uh, parts locator and putting everything back the way it should be. So for example, this should be a 3K 5 watt resistor, so I've got a replacement here. Nice vitreous enamel, so I'll pop that guy in. The one inside the high voltage box should be 8500 ohm, 25 watt. 
as memory serves, it's not something that's commonly available, but I think what I ended up doing in the past was I took a 10K and threw, I think, a 20K or something like that in parallel with it. Hopefully I've got enough on hand. I know I bought a few in the past because I was doing a bunch of Admiral sets and I wanted to uh, make sure I could do the same trick again. So I think I've got some left. Those are the only uh, major things so far. Uh, the only thing that puzzles me, I guess, I guess, a little bit is the use of some of these old school replacement parts. So all of these, these are Panasonic plastic film caps. These are the kind that they sell now and I've used them on numerous other projects. So that makes sense. But these, these are all old spray orange drops. They may or may not still make them. Uh, but some of the values are odd. Like this is a .036. That's kind of an oddball value. I think the original was .03. For the replacement, I'd usually use a .033, not a .036. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, these guys, I'm inclined to replace all of them with uh, something more akin to this. And see if I can find a single part for this one that they doubled up some caps in series. When you put caps in series, the value gets divided be well, in the case if they're the same value, it gets cut in half. So we got two point oh two twos in series. That would make it a point zero one one microfarad cap. Uh, as many of these are all point oh ones. So they clearly they had some, but that's a pretty long span. And one of these guys wouldn't be long enough, so I wonder if they did that just instead of using a single point zero one at any extension lead to it. Uh -huh. um, over here, another situation where they put two parts, this time in parallel rather than series. When you put them in parallel, the values add together. So I'm thinking maybe they didn't have the right value and they doubled a couple up to get to the correct value. Uh, I don't know. What, so again, what puzzles me is some of these caps, like these, and some of the, most of these electrolytics are pretty new, and they're high quality, they must have ordered them from somewhere, but then why did they use parts that are decades old that they probably found out of a junk bin or something for other stuff? And why did they choose to replace some things and not others? Like, there's another can gnome resistor up here. Um, I left that one in place. And uh, I really like to replace these large carbon comp resistors with something a little more modern. They tend to drift off of value. The carbon comps in general tend to drift off value, but especially the power ones I like to replace. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I got no explanation for why they didn't replace that. Rather than dive into that rat's nest in this corner, I thought I'd start over on the front end where things are a little less complicated. That power resistor that was crumbling was definitely open. I've replaced it and started going over the work here. Uh, this is the vertical output tube. Um, that's where they had doubled up a couple caps for the cathode bypass. These are probably okay, but it was overkill. The original was 50 microfarad at 50 volt. And they had doubled up two 33s that give you about 66 and they're 160 volt caps. So I put in a 56 microfarad rated for 63 volts. And uh, it's so small I was able to just put it across two pins and replace the cathode um, resistor, which had gone up a bit in value. And I started looking at these ceramic caps that they put in to see what they uh, were originally. And really, this was a paper cap. And it's a fairly important one. Uh, let's see. It's this guy right here. It couples the signal from the oscillator to the output tube. Bad choice for ceramic. Especially what I believe is a Z5U. That is the dielectric type. It just says Z on here, but I think that's what that means. Why is that bad? Well, one, it's temperature dependent, so as the set warms up, the value will change. Two, it's voltage dependent. 
Yeah, the capacitance on most ceramic caps varies as the voltage on it changes. So, if that was a nice clean sawtooth wave going in, that's not what you're going to get going out. Especially, uh, so this is a 500 volt cap, especially if that signal is several hundred volts. Uh, it's going to get distorted. It'll go from a sawtooth into a bent sawtooth. So that is going to get replaced with a plastic film cap for sure. I will be replacing this capacitor for the same reason. Now you may be wondering if ceramic capacitors are so lousy, why are they even made? Why does anybody use them? A few reasons. One big one is they are very inexpensive. Another is you can get quite a bit of capacitance in a small package. These are 0.1 microfarad 500 volt caps. The paper equivalent would be something like that size. And even a modern plastic film version are pretty sizable. That cap would cost you a few cents. This would probably cost you more than a buck. So considerable cost difference there. Also depending on the application it may not matter if the, if the capacitance varies a bit with temperature or with applied voltage for example if it's a bypass capacitor if you're just filtering noise off of a DC bus doesn't matter. However, if you're coupling signals, especially if the amplitude of the signal is getting anywhere near the voltage rating on the cap. So as a 500 volt cap, if there was a 400 volt signal going across this, it would definitely get distorted. If it was a 1 volt peak to peak signal, no. That being said, um, I'm not comfortable using these. Another aspect is the dielectric type. There are a dozen or more different dielectrics you can get that all have different characteristics. Some don't vary as much with temperature. Or they vary with temperature over a certain range more than others. Like maybe at room temperature they're fairly stable, but you get above 100 degrees or below freezing, they might vary quite a bit more. But if it's kept within a narrow range, it doesn't vary so much. And there's also a type, they used to call them NP0, now C0G, that are very temperature stable and don't really have that uh, property of changing a capacitance with applied voltage. However, there's a trade-off. They don't have as much capacitance per unit volume, so you typically only see them in the picofarad range, and they cost more, and they're bigger. Maybe if you looked really hard, you could find a 0.1 microfarad C0G cap for 500 volts. Probably not, but if you did, it'd probably cost you 20 bucks or more, and it would be huge. So, that being said, where these are being used, especially this one, coupling this vertical signal, I don't think that is a good choice, so that will get replaced. Um, but in other parts, I mean, and, and if you look at newer TVs, they definitely start using caps more and more and more, especially in the RF and IF sections, because using them for RF bypass, like across the uh, cathode bias resistor, it's a great application for them. But not for signal coupling, not for oscillators, where they're going to drift with temperature. I finished work down in here, so that takes care of the vertical output uh, and vertical hold and vertical height. And uh, curiously, this was also the wrong value. Should have been 0.05, they had a 0.03 in there. Uh, for replacements, I went with Panasonic's, very similar to the ones that were used in most of the rest of the set. And that got me thinking, maybe this set was repaired, restored, at two different times in period, and uh, maybe like back in the 60s, some repairs were done, and that's where these caps came from. And maybe more recently when it was worked on, they saw that, well, these are newer caps, they're probably okay, and just left them alone and didn't even mess with it. I don't know. But I do know that, well, from here over, it's done, so I'll continue working my way on this way. 
this would be the vertical integrator sink separator stuff down in here they appear to have used plastic film for all of it I definitely want to take a look at this and see why they use two in series and replace it with a single cap well, fuse looks like it might be a tad on the too big side. It should be, I think, a quarter amp fuse. That's on the flyback, but that looks a little hefty. <laughs> huh. I cannot see any current rating on this fuse. You'd think it'd be super prominent, easiest thing to read. Don't see it. 250V UL SA. And on the other side bus, I assume it's a busman fuse, MDV and then a 1, does that mean it's a 1 amp fuse with MDV characteristics? I don't know, you'd think it'd be in huge bold <laughs> print on there what the current rating is, well I know it's supposed to be a quarter amp, I've got a bunch of quarter amp fuses so that's what I'll be putting in there. Slow and steady progress. Working on this tube now. Uh, this is where there were two caps in series. The value did um, was pretty close to the specified value. Those two caps in series came out to about 0 0.011, and their stated value is 0 0.01 on the schematic, so probably would have worked fine, but I went ahead and replaced it anyways just to avoid confusion and seeing two capacitors connected together. Likewise, the guy down here I replaced with a single cap. Well, those two weren't parallel. Uh, and just now I re removed the IF shield. I realized it was the only part of the circuit or chassis I hadn't looked at yet. Video IF. So here's the tuner. On the top side there's an oscillator, mixer, and RF amp. That comes out and goes right into this. So this is a uh, three-stage IF, and then I believe that's a detector tube, and then a video amp and uh, pick off up here for the sound. So split sound and video. They split off the sound and video carriers right after the tuner. And then there's a separate IF amp for sound and separate IF amp for video. And these are the coils you would peek if you wanted to uh, align this. So if you ever want to practice aligning a vintage TV Admirals, it's very straightforward. In fact, this whole IF is actually in a separate sub-assembly. So here's a few screws here. I bet in the factory they had a dedicated area to aligning these and they just popped them in. Straightforward because you can do this without a sleep generator. You won't be able to see the overall response, which should be a nice flat top around 4 megahertz or so. Because this is a staggered IF. So instead of having very like uh, two, three, four stages where each stage should have a wide response and it's just increasing gain, this is a series of tuned circuits peaked to a single frequency. And when you add up all the responses, the overall response is a nice wide bandwidth. So really, if you go through the alignment instructions, you peak each one of these at a fixed frequency with a fixed frequency RF generator and a VTVM or a scope. You don't need to sweep it to align it. Same for the sound. So, I can't tell from looking at it if anybody's really messed with it. We shall find out. Looks like they didn't really do anything at all up in here, which is generally a good thing because that's the more complicated stuff if you don't have the right equipment so you don't want to be monkeying with it. If there's any fault with the Admiral sets, it's a very straightforward, solid design. They work really well. Often they work with just a minimal amount of effort, recapping-wise, except for sound. Because in the sound IF and ratio detector transformers, there are mica capacitors that are exposed types. The same kind like in radios, All-American 5s, where you get that crashing sound and you lose gain. Same reason. Exposed silver on a mica insulator, and you get silver migration, you get shorts, and so on. So, 
it's a little tedious, but I've done it before. I've shown videos. I'll probably be doing it again. Pop these open, remove those caps, install modern and epoxy encapsulated mica capacitors in their place. But getting ahead of myself, just a slow, steady <laughs> sweep across the bottom here. Then I'll work my way up. So far, no more surprises. I uh, um, have pretty well gone through this and everything that looked a little bit odd to me I double checked all the caps do seem to be the correct value more or less and they're hooked into the right place um, so I'm, I'm hoping there won't be uh, any surprises as I'm seeing more uh, more ceramic caps down in there Although that does say NPO huh well, that's a fairly critical tube as I recall that might be the horizontal oscillator I do believe it is. That should probably be a mica cap. Huh. Yeah, definitely got to do. Hmm. So I do have one bit of advice too when you're working on uh, pretty much any vintage tube-based TV. If you're going to put any time, effort, and money into it, first thing, horizontal. May be a pain, may take a while, but... I recommend pretty much replace everything if you can, including the carbon comp, because if you use stable parts, silver mica, uh, metal oxide, uh, resistors, stuff that's very temperature stable, you can avoid a lot of issues down the road with uh, having to tweak it and adjust it as the set warms up and so on. Or you know, Parts in here get kind of stressed too, and then the next circuit would be the vertical. I mean, one of the most common things you see in a vintage set is the vertical deflection goes out and you get a horizontal line and it burns a line into the picture tube. It's because this stuff craps out. Uh, either a transformer or a vertical output transformer or something down there. Time for another quick update. Finish with the vertical circuitry. The vertical integrator, oscillator, output. And then moved on over to this area which is the AGC and replaced one giant capacitor that was up in here 0 0.47 200 volt I don't believe it or not this little cap hiding in the back here that is a 0 0.47 250 volt capacitor I also found a mistake this should be 1000 picofarad they had 10,000 picofarad in there so corrected that and this was another big 0.47 microfarad, and that actually couples the yoke signal. We can see that right here. So they capacitively couple the yoke to the flyback. All right, then I moved into the dreaded corner where we've got all this mess. And quickly found some more things I didn't like. So this socket is a horizontal output tube. It's a cathode bias resistor. I'll be replacing that with a much smaller one. Typically these have drifted off value. I'm sure that one is no exception. I haven't tested it yet though. And this is the drive control. It's a variable capacitor. That controls the amount of drive signal that gets into the grid of the horizontal output tube. Off of that, they've got this ugly looking ceramic cap with a lead extension on it. 470 picofarad. Uh, this originally was a mica capacitor. I don't think this is an NP0 ceramic cap. So this would drift with temperature. That would very likely cause horizontal instability so that's got to go but it's also the wrong value it should be 270 that is right here so you got your sawtooth coming out of the horizontal oscillator goes to these two caps and this one is variable that forms well essentially an AC voltage divider so by varying this you control how much of this it'll get shunted to ground and it goes through this resistor and then horizontal output tube. So, got to replace that with a 270 picofarad mica cap. And I don't 
worked out. I'll see some other issues down in here as I go through it. I also want to see about maybe relocating some of these to open this up a little bit. I don't like having this 47 microfarad, 450 a little cap or this cap down in here. This area gets a bit warm. Uh, I, don't, I don't like it for that reason. Also, I think we've got some space up here that would be more suitable. I'm trying to cram so much stuff down in this area. Too many, uh, too much uh, congestion, too many possibilities of a mistake. It's hard to see where all those wires are going. I just noticed another bit of fun down here off of pin 4 in the horizontal oscillator tube. They've got three ceramic caps hooked up. At least on one of them I can see it says NP0. Well, it should be 50 picofarad. So we've got two in series. Let's see if this guy is also 100. That should give him 50, so why do they have a third cap? So there's two caps in series and then one in parallel. Okay, yeah, so there are two 100 picofarad caps in series that are NP0, which is a 50 picofarad cap. So why did they put this little dinky guy? Well, that's got me thinking that they couldn't get this thing to run at the right frequency, so they were monkeying around with this. Could also be that these caps didn't have the best tolerance, and maybe they aren't quite 100 picofarads. Oh, it's hard to see. I think it says 33, which would really increase that to be well, well over 50. So that's odd. Well, I'm going <laughs> to put it back to stock. Now, 50 is an odd value, to, to, to be fair. Um, I doubt I have any, but I'll look. I probably have a 47, and maybe have a 51. Either one of those is probably close enough. I mean, that's what this big old coil is for, is to adjust the horizontal frequency, so I don't think that value is super critical, as long as they're plus minus 10%, it should be fine. And I can see another one down in there, so let's see, it's off between pins 2 and 4. That should be a 330. So all of these should be mica caps, a 330, the 50, and a 270. And I also wonder... Were they really all bad? That seems unlikely. So I wonder, did they just replace them because they thought they should? Or were they trying to solve some horizontal issue and they just replaced them anyways? I don't know. Um, but uh, I'll put uh, some mica caps in there. I said, I mean, N NP0 is basically as good as mica. They're probably all right, but I don't know what the voltage rating is on these. They look kind of cheap, so I'm not crazy about leaving them in there. I'm going to be placing an order for parts because, as always, I never seem to have everything that I need. Before doing so, I want to verify that I've got the mica caps I'm going to need for the insides of these cans. So. I just loosened up the covers from below, and here they are. Now these, they were nice. They pretty clearly stamped 30. That one's a little smudge, but I believe that side's 30 as well. Now it's interesting because in the SAMs, they show a cap on both sides, but don't show a value. In the riders, they show a cap on one side, and it's 30, but there's nothing on the other. So, <laughs> well... Hmm. I'm pretty sure that's 30 on both sides. Uh, unfortunately, this one is not marked. According to riders, though, I think they say it's 35. So, that's what I'll go with. I'm also going to refer back to photos when I've worked on this chassis before that I took and see if those were marked. But as you can see, it's just <laughs> a hunk of mica that they deposited some silver on both sides of, and, uh, gradually and starts to corrode and can lead to problems so and to get them off is pretty easy you just like on this one you just heat up 
heat these two sides up and it just pulls right off the top and then tack on a new capacitor. I looked at the reference photos in the SAMS photo fact and some photos I had taken of another 20B1 series chassis I restored and noted that there were a lot of micas in this thing originally. For example, I believe there were four of them down here where we now have plastic film. This guy was also mica, as was the one across this coil, as were the ones that are now ceramic. So one, two, and that assembly there, all of those were originally mica. The ones in the vertical integrator, I have used plastic film for these before and never had a problem. I've also seen them uh, done with paper caps and other Admiral models and they seem to be okay so I think mica is a little bit overkill and the reason I try to avoid it when it makes sense is they're expensive especially when you get into the larger values like these are 2200 picofarad they might be five bucks each. Uh, NP0 ceramic or um, a good name brand plastic film or polystyrene actually if you get a higher voltage rating rated polystyrene they're very stable as well. Uh, that one I'm not too concerned about. That's kind of in the AGC circuit. This guy though, that is across the horizontal oscillator coil. 3900 picofarad. I'm going to see how much a mica one would cost. I believe I have used plastic foam in other ca uh, sets before. I kind of wish the original micas were still here, because if I tested good, I'd, I'd keep using them. Um, but, but anyways, uh, but for sure these. 330, 330, 270, really common values. They're about two bucks each at DigiKey. I'll, I'll just order up some new ones. I think I might. Actually, no, I, I've already dug up a few of them I had on hand. Uh, here's a 270. So that's what a modern silver mica cap looks like if you haven't seen them before. Sometimes they're yellow, sometimes they're brown. Typically come in ratings of either 250 or 500 volts. And, uh, well, anyways. So that's what I'll be putting, so that guy will replace this. Uh, while I'm waiting for the parts to arrive, I'll uh, keep working on the rest of it. The fun continues. Down in this area, I removed the two newer caps that had put put in there so I could see what was going on down below. So we had a 47 at 450 and a 10 at 350. I think this is the boost filter cap. So the negative side was not going to ground, it was going to some other voltage. Take a look at that in a moment. This guy, I do believe, was the low B plus filter cap. Remember, on the lower power supply, well, let's look at this schematic here. There's a low voltage rectifier. One filter cap, choke, and then no second filter cap, like you would typically see, like we see in the high voltage B+. However, if we follow it, this is the connector between the lower and upper chassis. This is the bus in the upper chassis, the low B+. Plus. Hey, there's a 40 microfarad filter cap up here. I think that's what that was tacked in there for. So, I suppose that is an okay place to put it. Since you got a ground lug right next to it, so I may do that. However, what else is around here that's on that low B+, plus? well nothing. The <laughs> thing that I can see on this lug is a wire that goes up to this lug which then goes to everything else that uses this bus in the set. So I suppose they could have run the wire from the connector here all the way up to that point and not even use this lug at all. So that's what I found. So I gotta double check is that correct or was there something else down here connected to that? I'm not sure, but that's what I'm seeing. So what I'm getting at is I could also put the filter cap somewhere up here. Although on this terminal strip, 
Ah, this is a new one. This is not, I just, wow, I just noticed that. Huh. I thought this was an original ter power strip. Or terminal strip. This is not. Huh. Well, that explains that weirdness, then. Sort of. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So, the filter cap is here. They put a terminal strip right next to it. So this blue wire, and then there's another blue wire I, I uh, disconnected. And I'm poking out here. This also connects to this point. As this is this 8.2K resistor. So we got three things going to this lug that must have used to have all gone to one of these three lugs. Okay, I mean, that's, that's a way to do it. Um, but what I don't like is they attach this terminal strip by just putting a solder blob on one of the lugs on the old filter cap. It's not screwed down. So it's just tacked in on that one lug. I imagine if I flex this a bit, it would break off. But what else I thought was odd is there are no grounded lugs on this. Because of the terminal strip type they use, the two that could potentially be bolted to the chassis do not protrude upwards with grounding lugs. Now this capacitor here does have a negative lead on it going to this terminal strip which is just floating. So what did they do? They ran a wire way over here to ground it. I think we can do better. I think we can do better. I'll probably end up taking this out. I mean, I can see the merits of it because, for example, this must have been another capacitor lug. And we've got a bunch of things connected here. If I take this terminal strip out, put the, I'm sure I could find somewhere to put the filter cap. But then what? how do I attach these components together? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, if I do still use a terminal strip, I will secure it better. I'm kind of curious. I don't feel like going back and watching all the old footage, but <laughs> when I restored a similar chassis, how did I do it? See, they stuck another filter cap there. I must so have this three section cap. I'm thinking um, these are the three this one, this one, and this one. And then there was another three section cap there, which was probably this cap, this cap, and this cap. That's what I'm thinking. Hmm. All right, so I got that to, to mull over. Also, I don't think this resistor is big enough. Should be a 10K 2 watt. That looks more like a 1 watt resistor to me. Maybe why it's a little crummy looking, so that's going to get replaced. Now back to these capacitors. So uh, I'm ordering up some stuff from DigiKey this time around, and mica caps, when you get up to like 3,900, if you can even find them, they're like 25 bucks. So that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, so, I am going to use a C0G for this, and for the 330s, and for the 270. However, the IF cans will be mica. It's funny, you know, that people ask, like, what, why are there three different types of capacitor, or what type should I use? Well, sometimes it's dictated by what you can get. So, back in the day... When you needed stability, it was a mica capacitor. That was your only choice. They didn't really have have good C0G and P0 type ceramic caps yet. And paper caps were definitely out of the question. They're not stable. So, flash forward, ceramic technology has improved considerably and micas have slowly faded out of favor. Except, when you're talking about really small values, like below 100 picofarad, mica still dominates above a 100 or 200 picofarad ceramic seems to dominate so i can't get np0 c0 g ceramic caps in low picofarad values they don't exist unless you go with really low voltage like maybe 50 volts or 100 volts and even then they're likely to be surface mount so i really didn't have a choice but to pay two bucks a piece for some uh, mica caps for the sound IF cans, two thirties and a thirty-five. The rest will go with uh, ceramic. 
Maybe we'll do a little experiment, at least on this guy. I'm kind of curious, so once the set's operating, maybe get a scope on here and look at the frequency and then maybe put a little heat gun on it. And I'll try maybe using a, uh, a type of ceramic that drifts a lot. Like these are probably Z5U because it's got a Z on it. Which have terrible temperature characteristics. Like in other words, the capacitance changes quite a bit as the temperature changes. And uh, curious to see how much frequency. Like w in other words, as the set warms up, is it more likely to lose horizontal hold if I use a super cheap ceramic cap versus one that's temperature stable? That will be fun to do. Assuming this is working. <laughs> so, still got quite a bit of work ahead. The order's going to take a while to get here. Um, meanwhile, I will do as much as I can until it does. I was just looking at that width control that I thought was damaged. I thought that the control shaft had broken off, or the adjustment shaft. But no. That slotted brass thing at the end. That is connected to an iron slug at the other end. Somebody adjusted it so deep that it went past the stop and went down inside. I don't think it's broken at all. I think I just got to back it out. And then there should be there should be two metal prongs that snap it into the chassis. And one of them is either broken off or it somehow got jammed up into the insulating sleeve there. Well, if I can't salvage that, I can probably get one out of another coil. But, uh, well, first off, let's see if I can back that out. I wonder if somebody knew that and tried to repair this and, like, removed this and then jammed it back on or something. I don't know, man. Uh. Okay, uh, yeah, I <laughs> pushed up on the core from this end and got a small jeweler screwdriver in there and backed it out, and sure enough, it is adjustable. And that metal tab was indeed jammed up inside, so I think this will be just fine. I may have to put a little bit of epoxy or something on this collar to reinforce it where some of the material broke off, but otherwise I think this coil is perfectly fine.